Once you've found your purpose, that's great. That's step one. Then you need to break that down into more actionable targets. So just like I said, if I put on my Trello board that in six months time, I want to speak on this stage or speak at this event, then you've got to break down how are you actually going to get there. Hi, this is Shlomo Sosin, the host of the Teenage Impact Podcast, where I share stories, tips, and specific strategies on how you as a teenage kid can overcome any struggle in your life. Whether you're going through anxiety, depression, confidence issues, you're being bullied, I've interviewed 59 people from around the world on what they have gone through as a teenager, how they overcame it, and how you can too. I came out with a new, fun, interactive, and short uh, quiz. It's called What's My Resiliency Type Based on How You Overcome Struggles in Life, and it's High School Sports Edition. My uh, result was long distance running, which is ironic because I'm a long distance runner. So it's pretty accurate. Yours could be a basketball, it could be swimming, whatever it is, it could be football. I want you to go check out the quiz and see what your result is. It's the link in the description. Today's podcast guest is Elliot Patfield. Elliot is a 17 year old millionaire entrepreneur. He's one of UK's leading young entrepreneurs in real estate, healthcare businesses, and security. Elliot is also the president of the Invictus Group. He's also an investor. He's a speaker. He likes inspiring other young minds around the world. So give it up for Elliot Patfield as he's going to talk about how you as a high school student can build a successful business. What's up, Elliot? Hey there. How are you doing? Man, I'm good, man. You're tuning in from the UK, correct? That is very right. Yep, very correct. Uh-huh. And for those who don't know, I, Elliot was very generous. It was very generous of him. I saw someone else interview Elliot um, a few weeks ago. So I, I, I thought I would reach out to him because I thought he's a very smart, ambitious, and successful young man. And he's upcoming. And so everybody needs to watch out for this guy coming up. Well, soon. it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me on. Uh-huh. So before we go into your entrepreneurship story and how you became successful, let's, let's figure out who Elliot was before entrepreneurship and before you became an entrepreneur. Sure thing. So, I mean, my journey actually isn't particularly interesting. So, I mean, I came from, you know, a normal background, an average background. I don't come from an entrepreneurial family or anything of, you know, any form of significance. Um, And I mean, for me, I think even from a very young age, the thing that separated me apart is that I thought, I I mean, I think I'm naturally quite a competitive person, um, but I always wanted to be, you know, going above and beyond doing something more. I mean, even from a very young age, you know, whether it was pre-reading content. So when I got into the classroom, I already knew what what we'd be talking about in that lesson or, you know, whatever it was, I was always very interested. I mean, one of like my first memories of that being really true, just as I was starting my entrepreneurial journey is when I um, started at middle school and they do like introductory web design classes and I remember my teacher at the time ended up essentially asking me to teach the class for him and that was like for me one of those moments where I realized how much I thrived on that sort of level of knowledge and I think one thing that you know as we go on and discuss this that's going to be really consistent is my passion and love for learning and knowledge I mean even now when I'm you know having loads of meetings or whatever it is in my spare time I'm reading looking at forums listening to podcasts whatever it is so I mean that's really me before I don't I'm, I was I was never really a particularly confident person I mean like if you read my school reports all through elementary and, and middle school you know there's not much of interest I was actually quite a shy quiet person and even to this day actually I, I'm not that different but it was sort of my first year of high school where things changed for me I developed my public speaking and to think that you know all the entrepreneurship happened in the middle and I'm now here you know speaking on stages to, uh, groups of other students you know into high schools or corporate events no it's really exciting Mm-hmm. So you were a, a very shy kid, just like I was when I was back oh. in middle school. But what what changed in the ninth grade year? Okay, so I mean, for me, actually, it was one sort of particular person. There was a new member of staff, actually, uh, the vice principal at the school that had come in new that year. Um, and I, I don't know, I'd really clicked with the guy. And I mean, even to this day, actually, I'm not in high school anymore. But, you know, I, I talked to him a lot. And I don't know, it was just having that figure that almost gave me that little bit of additional confidence. The thing that I often say, you know, when I'm on stage speaking to other high schoolers, is that I was that kid that, you know, in 
fast, knew the answer to the question, but for some reason still wouldn't put their hand up to answer the question. And there's no reason to it. Yeah. And then when some, you know, when nobody puts their hand up and the teacher, you know, gives the answer, in your head you're kicking yourself because it's like, I knew that. Why didn't, you know, why didn't I give the answer? And that was, that was very much me. And I think, you know, the education system for me didn't have the right opportunities to develop my skills. And I think, you know, this new teacher came in, he was very passionate about debate and public speaking and started that and almost took me under his wing, if you like, at the start of high school. And I developed very quickly. And I mean, I think really public speaking is something that I have had a natural affinity for, but it just wasn't something that was exploited by the education system. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to think that throughout the time of high school, you know, between my, between my, um, my freshman year and my junior year, I went from someone that wasn't really that confident in any situation at all to actually one of the United Kingdom's best debaters. And, you know, I, I, I ended up leading the school's teams with whatever we were doing. And I think that the other thing for me is that I started to build a network around me of people that were supportive. I think that the education system, if you let it get into your head too much, can be quite bad if you're trying to go against the curve. I mean, I think that there's a fear, certainly that a lot of people I work with have, that, you know, by doing something different or starting, you know, something else, that, that, that that's almost frowned upon or, you know, they, they feel the nerves of doing it. But the one core piece of advice is actually go, are you going to be happy on the route you are? And if you're not, then you need to do something about it. And that's what it was for me. It was the fear of being average and a fear of being like, like everybody else. And that's what really drove me to get started. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's, that's an amazing story. So it all started with a public speaking teacher that kind of took you under the wing, and you kind of learned from him. Um, what would you tell someone that is in the ninth, 10th grade that was shy, just like you and wants to become more confident? Sure thing. I mean, the first thing I would say is start small. I don't think it's going to help anyone, you know, you might have a big end goal and that's great because it's something you can work towards. You might want to say, okay, you know, I want to give a speech to an audience of 500 people. Don't start there, but you know, start small. I mean, if you don't have that figure or, you know, that, that person to guide you, then, you know, you've got to take it in slightly smaller steps. So even if it is just doing things like volunteering answers in class, actually it's all developing towards that same skill set. And the other thing I would say is try and find people almost to hold you accountable and to support you through it. I mean, for me, obviously that was my teacher, but even now, you know, in business much later on, I still have people that if I'm starting a new project or I want to do something new, I go and tell them and I say, you know, I want you to ring me up every single week and say, have you progressed towards this goal? And, you know, maybe that is going to be like a, a friend in school for you. Maybe it is. Or maybe actually, you know, there are so many um, entrepreneurs and public speakers and people actually that you can contact on the internet. And most people are more than willing to help you. Literally, I just, you know, came off an interview uh, with a young motivational speaker who didn't really have that source of motivation and actually went and essentially went on Grant Cardone's live, live, um, live stream. And basically Grant Cardone is now holding him accountable. And when that happened, this guy had only got 130 followers. You know, nothing is out of reach for you. It is all about the confidence to push forward. And the one thing I would say, if you're struggling with motivation, struggling to push yourself outside your, com uh, your comfort zone, is actually think about how much it's going to hurt if you don't achieve your goals. That was it for me. I was afraid of failing and what I essentially changed that is instead of being afraid of failing, I was afraid of the consequences of failure. And then you, you twist that and essentially that becomes a motivating factor. Mm -hmm. It's so true. People get so stuck in fear and they live their whole life in fear. Uh, for example, uh, about six months ago, I went full time with Teenage Impact. I quit my full time job. I had a salary, full time salary. And I left that all behind, moved to a brand new city, no business connections, just to pursue Teenage Impact. And just like what you said is you have to step outside the fear. And that, yes, there is the fear of failure. But what if, what if, you're, if, if you could turn that fear and what if that could have been something greater than what you could have achieved in the future? I think that's what we should be scared of is the what if it worked out.
Exactly right. I mean, like for me, my main goal, I get asked this a lot, you know, what, what's my big goal? And for me, actually, it's achieving my potential and achieving what I can do in my lifetime. I mean, mm. it sounds and you know, when I say this to people, you know, people go, you know, it's quite morbid for someone quite young to think like this. But at the end of the day, I've realized at a very young age that life actually isn't that long. We only have a very limited amount of time. And I want to be able to spend as much of that time being happy, knowing that I have used that time wisely. Absolutely. And like for me, I mean, that was the reason, right? You know, basically end of junior year, I dropped out of high school. And for me, actually, it was that thing of, I've got so much I want to do. I've literally got people phoning me up, asking me to come to conference. And yet, you know, I'd taken loads of time off school to go and do public speaking. And it was getting to the stage where I was actually never in school. And I'm like, why am I wasting my time doing something when I could be making a far huger impact and making my life more worthwhile? And I think that's exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to go. And that's the way that I drive myself every single second. Am I using the time to the, you know, to the best of my advantage? I want to be able to have the biggest impact I can, not only while I'm alive, but then also through legacy. And that's really important to me. And I think the second big motivating factor for me is that because I'm quite a competitive person, every day I'm not working, every day I'm not improving myself, every day I'm not pushing forward. That's a day that somebody else is catching up. And that's quite a big deal for me. So that doesn't mean that you need to be, you know, if you're, if you're an entrepreneur making sales calls every day, you know, for me, a day of reading where I don't respond to a single email is just as productive. And you've just got to, I think it is such a huge mindset thing. And I think that the, you know, the traditional education system is incredibly valuable. 99% of people want the stability of a traditional job. That's great. The education system is going to serve you well. But some of the habits that that system teaches you, if you want to be an entrepreneur or you want to go out there and do something differently, is quite, you know, it's not the right information. And you have to train yourself essentially to not only overcome what you're being taught, but what 99% of people around you are thinking. And certainly mm. in my last few years at school, that was the big thing that I found quite difficult is, you know, everybody was preparing their applications applications to college and you know they were the problems they were having I was having problems of you know I'd got a, a role to fill and I couldn't fit I couldn't find the time to do recruitment whatever it was when you've got no one around you to support you it can be incredibly incredibly difficult but once again you've just got to keep your eyes and your mind focused on what's going to happen if you give up did you ever feel left out not directly in the sense that I think most people would consider that I realized, I think probably, and this was all part of the, the journey of me deciding to leave high school, is that I began to realize that I had a lot of friends, you know, a lot of people that I'd spend time with, really enjoy the company of, hang out with, whatever it was. But the one thing that I didn't have was anyone particularly genuine. I had a lot of acquaintances, a lot of casual friends, mm. but I felt like there was nobody that I could really open up to. And I felt like I was having to tone down who I was to fit in more. And I really realized that actually that was not helpful for me. Mm -hmm. And why should I be limiting myself in order to essentially impress other people? And, you know, for me, making that big decision of leaving high school and saying, actually, look, this is who I am and what I do. I'm not, you know, afraid of that anymore. And, you know, there's a lot of people that I almost lost, but actually it allowed me to single out those people that have really got my back and that was really important and I think entrepreneurship as a whole not just in the education system but throughout life because 99% of people in life wherever you are are on that same journey you know progressing up the career ladder working towards retirement getting your 401k whatever it is wherever you are entrepreneurship or going against the curve can be incredibly incredibly lonely and having a good support network or certainly a mental way to take over that is incredibly important because if you think you know, about entrepreneurship, you're going against the curve. Every single time that you achieve something or you gain something, tomorrow morning, you could get a phone call to say that it's gone away. You know, I might be at the end of the day ce celebrating a great day of sales, you know, I've closed X amount of clients today. But tomorrow, I might, you know, make the same amount of calls and get absolutely no sales. Mm -hmm. You can never be comfortable. And that's why I don't think entrepreneurship is for everybody. You do need to be able to thrive on that. But mm -hmm. it's difficult, it is very difficult. But the mindset is so important, definitely. Yeah, I think I remember when I was doing sales, I did door-to-door -door sales for a little bit. And, you know, s some people would say you have to detach yourself from the outcome, whether it is positive or whether it is negative. Because sometimes your highs will be high. Sometimes you are having a lot of sales. And then all of a sudden, um, the next day, you don't have any sales. So when when you have a lot of 
success or a lot of failure. You have to take away the positive and the negative emotion. Not saying um, you shouldn't feel those emotions, but don't dwell on that much success or that much failure to the point where it distracts you for the rest of the day or for the rest of the week. Yeah, sure thing. I mean, yeah, you've got to find value in the process, I think, very much so. Mm -hmm. Like for me, you know, if I if I have 10 appointments set by one of my team, and I'm closing deals, and I don't close anything. In my mind, that's actually no more productive or no less productive than a day where I close those deals. Because at the end of the day, the learning process is just as productive as actually closing. Mm -hmm. I would much rather have a day where I close no deals, if that means I'm going to close 10 deals for the rest of my career, than if I'd close five Five deals on day one I think you've got to understand the value of learning and that's why for me you know if I take a day off and I'm not responding to emails or I'm not in meetings or I'm not on podcasts and I'm actually just spending a day reading catching up talking to people on industry forums then that for me is just as productive I think measuring productivity in the traditional sense of actually the output of a person or the output of a business is wrong because there is such a drive there on pure results. But I think you have to shift that and instead look at productivity of, of the value that you have essentially generated. And learning and developing yourself is just as valuable as actually closing a deal or you know responding to emails. Mm -hmm. Now let's go into how you got started with creating your businesses. Sure thing. So, I mean, for me, the, the big thing was, is I think because I was so driven and so motivated because I'd, I'd picked up that factor early on, just getting started was quite easy for me. And that's the advice. I mean, I think I have generally for people is just get started because it's the best way to learn. Reading mm. books are great. Listening to podcasts and YouTube videos are, you know, are great as well, but actually getting started is the best way to do that. So for me, my first business was a digital marketing and web design business. I'd learned those skills. Look, the internet is you know, a huge, huge resource. You can learn how to do literally anything. Uh, and there are so many free courses and there's so many cheap courses. Learn a skill, first of all, I think is the most important. Because once again, you can't go in from day one and say that you want to run the next unicorn startup, you know, that's valued at a billion dollars. You don't want to be the next WeWork or the next Airbnb. Start mm. small and have a, if you like, a sandbox or a playground where you can develop those skills. And I think a small company is really good for that. So I learned web design and some bits of digital marketing. And I started off actually on freelance marketplaces, once again, just to get a little bit of a portfolio behind me. And then I launched my first digital agency that was called Padfield Digital. Um, and I grew that, you know, I mean, it was essentially just a free, it was me as a freelancer with a brand over the top of it. And I worked on that for a long, long, long time. And then over time, my interest started to change. and I was starting to identify new opportunities. I qualified about a year later in cybersecurity. And that was sort of became the main focus of my company. And I got to the stage where I was having too much work than I could handle. I started outsourcing work to other freelancers. Eventually, then I decided to bring that in-house. And I think that was the thing. I took it slowly and built it up by step by step. I found a skill that was valuable and I learned it. And I locked that down. Then I started working with clients and closing some deals for myself. And I got that locked down. Then I started to essentially turn it more into a brand, into a company. Mm -hmm. And I got that locked down. Then I realized I needed help, mastered outsourcing, which to this day, I think is still one of the most valuable skills I picked up. How to you know, build companies on a lean basis and outsource work. I got that locked down then i took on my next challenge of leasing office space and bringing people in and i think it is so intimidating when you just build a checklist of everything you need to have a billion dollar company because there's so much to learn and yeah. it, you, there, there is no point if you have never done work for a client learning how how to do your tax return or learning how to recruit for employees because it is not the main problem go break break your goal down into little steps and go, what do I actually need to know to move to the next step? All you probably need to know in that first instance is the skill that you're going to be selling. Um, and I think, you know, even to this day, that is so important. I use a productivity system that I built in Trello. So as well as having all my daily tasks, along the side, I have three of my long-term objectives. Usually it's six months, 12 months, 24 months. And I make sure that regardless of how much actual work I have to do, I'm always doing one thing that contributes to each of those long-term goals. Because it's so easy to get caught up in the short term that you're never actually moving forwards you're just firefighting you're just battling what, what the tasks of the day are and I think you know 
for me as an entrepreneur, that's between answering my emails and moving forward to a bigger goal. But if you're at school, you know, it might be that you've got work to do at home or you've got preparation to do for exams, but make sure you're still finding just a tiny little bit of time to push forward. Same thing if you're at work right now. You know, if you're in a nine to five job, it's tough. But at the end of the day, you're never going to quit your nine to five job unless you've got something started and you're on that journey. Mm. And unless, and you know, most people say, Oh, well, I'm going to wait until I leave my job to, to start that. But it's just this circular logic. So that would be my, my general insight. Mm -hmm. It seems like you've done so much at such a young age. You got started at what? 15 years old. Yeah, easily. I'd say before that, but yeah. Okay. 14, 15 years old. And it can seem like a lot, you know, you've done, you've done more than a lot of adults have just in a short amount of time. And it can be very intimidating, especially I know you, you've spoken around the world, different countries, spoken on stage, trained um, different people. What can you say is three action steps high school students can do to start a business, especially during this pandemic? Sure thing. Find, find yourself a mentor or someone to hold you accountable. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. It's a very easy time right now, you know, whether you're locked, at, locked in at home or whether you can go out and about, the point of the matter is the world is not functioning properly. You need someone to hold you accountable through this. It's very easy to spend this entire time at home doing nothing, essentially. But at the end of the day, you've got to have someone to hold you accountable. So the, the best thing would be to find a mentor. Find someone that's been through what you've done. There are actually quite a lot of people like me at different levels. You know, there are people that have achieved more than me, people that have achieved less, less than me. Get some insights from people and learn. That is the first thing I would say. And find someone to hold you accountable. Doesn't matter whether that's a friend. Doesn't matter whether that's someone random on the internet. It doesn't matter. That, that would be my first thing. The second thing is make sure you identify your skill gaps and fix them. So figure out what it is, let's say, that you want to offer and make sure that you can provide value. I think a lot of people go, when they're starting businesses, operate monetization first. The way that you need to be perceiving business is about value first. You want to reach a stage where you do not have to do any marketing, where you are so in demand. And that's what it is. I do lots of little things that all contribute to that. I mean, months ago, I wrote an article about TikTok, growing on TikTok. Now, I'm not by any stretch a social media consultant. That's not the work that I do. Yeah. But I wrote an article because actually it's something that I knew quite a lot of people that had large accounts. And I just thought I'd share some insights. I wrote a blog post and I posted it. That was three months ago. I still get four or five DMs a day asking people to, for me to do paid consultancy on their social media profiles. Provide value and the monetization will come afterwards. That's the exact same thing don't try and just compete with everybody by taking a little slice of the pie make your own pie by offering something that nobody else can that's what mj demarco who in my opinion is one of the most inspirational entrepreneurs that i follow calls a productocracy where essentially you are turning your service into a commodity that is traded on the open market because people value it so much that'd be my second thing make sure you've got the skills locked down and you're sure because it is so hard to sell unless you are confident in your own product. Mm -hmm. So make sure that you are confident that you can provide value. doesn't matter what that is, you know, what, whatever you're offering, just make sure you're providing the end user value. And then third of all, I would say is just start. And I've got so many examples, you know, I'm not going to go into them all of how just starting is so important. But even to this day, I mean, I've preached just start for a number of years now. But even to this day, I catch myself out sometimes. I, I recently bought a new business in South Florida a few months back. And I personally did the redesign of our website. So, you know, I've got the full website, all of the middle pages, everything done. I pushed it live. Now, because of an issue with, I don't even know what, probably WordPress or Cloudflare, all of the central pages of my website didn't actually publish. So I only had a front page and a contact page. Now, I would never have let that happen had I known that. I, I'm a control freak about these things, a perfectionist. The entire website was supposed to go live. Four days later, I go back and I look and all of these middle pages are gone and I'm absolutely distraught. But then I realize that I generated over $100,000 in sales over the last few days through that website. Don't think that anything has to be perfect. Don't think, 
you know, the biggest problem a lot of people have is action faking. Let's just say you've started, I don't know, a Shopify dropshipping store. You've got your products on there. You've got the bare minimum. I see so many people that say to me, okay, what am I going to do today? They're going to go and change their logo because they read an article that says, if your logo is green, more people buy, you know, the, high, <laughs> the conversion rates higher. And I say, look, you haven't got a single person coming to your website. Nobody cares. Go and run some ads, go and promote your products, whatever it is. Don't action fake, don't make excuses. It's very easy to change a logo, redesign your website, write some email templates, whatever it is. That is action faking. It makes you feel like you're an entrepreneur doing work, but you're not actually getting anywhere. So as soon as you have that minimum viable product, that might be a basic website for you and basically an idea of what you're gonna offer. Or for you, if you, you, know, if you wanna be a social media influencer, it might be a basic page and a basic content creation calendar. It doesn't matter, once you've got that basics, Go out there and start doing. And then as you start to develop and new challenges come up, that's when you can learn and expand what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Great tips. So find a mentor, number one. Number two, build a skill that no one has. And number three, just start. Yeah. 100%. Great tips. It's as simple as that. Simple as that. Now you uh, advertise yourself as, um, I know on your Instagram page, a 17-year-old uh, millionaire. How can someone become a millionaire sure thing it is the exact same secret as starting something small uh -huh. i think that people think that starting you know a, a huge company or developing a great amount of wealth has some secret formula to it but i can promise you it doesn't you don't need to be a silicon valley tech entrepreneur to make a million dollars you know it, it's it's not actually that hard you've just got to find something that you are good at a business model that works and scale and unfortunately, you can't grow a company this big from day one. But you know what? The exact same steps I've just given you is exactly the same way that you start a company that does $10 million in revenue a year. There's no difference, but you've just got to scale it. And don't, once again, don't think monetization first and don't think scale first. You can make a million dollars a year in any industry however boring there is no industry that has a market cap realistically of under a million dollars so don't go well i heard that you can make more money providing facebook ads to customers than you can google ads because nobody cares whatsoever you can still make enough money to hugely change your life doing either or and i think that's the important thing uh, there is no secret formula there is no course that is going to change your life i mean look there's huge values in some of the courses that people put out i provide mentorship and coaching myself because i know the value i can provide but no course and no mentor is going to solve your problems for you so don't keep you know looking for a book that's going to change your life or keep looking for a mentor that's going to do the work for you get started start making some money start developing some skills and then when you're ready to grow you're going to feel out of your depth that's fine that's the time to start you know really working find yourself a coach find something like that but at the end of the day start small it's exactly the same thing worry about the scale later mm -hmm. you know a lot of people they just get stuck in this hole the constant they're working hard they're working hard they feel like nothing's working and they're kind of, they hit that dead wall, dead end. How can someone get out of that dead end and overcome that hurdle? Okay. Begin to understand what it is that makes you happy as a person mm -hmm. or what it is that you want to achieve. Start to understand your purpose because if you spend your life chasing other people's dreams or other people's purposes, you're never going to feel fulfilled. It doesn't matter if you make, you know, a hundred million dollars. If you've done that in a way that you haven't enjoyed the process, it doesn't matter. And, you know, I mean, it, Pete, it, it sounds almost, you know, ironic coming from me as someone who has had success, but I can promise you the end result is not as good as it sounds ever. Mm -hmm. the, you have to enjoy the process because at the end of the day, the process is going to take up most of your life. And that is what you need to enjoy. Take the end result as a little bit of an icing on top, a cherry on top, whatever. So the thing I would say is start to understand your purpose. For me, I mean, I'm not religious, but, you know, I, I still feel that I have a purpose to serve. I still feel that, you know, I do, I have a duty to myself to achieve my potential. So for me, that's what drives me. For some people, it might be something more tangible or something more monetary, in which case, you know, set yourself a target, something you want to buy or an amount that you want to achieve by the end of five years and go and do that. That's absolutely fine. The other thing, I mean, I think that I would really say 
is that once you've defined that purpose, understand how you can essentially translate that into clear, actionable targets. Because the goal isn't everything. Once you've found yeah. your purpose, that's great. That's step one. Then you need to break that down into more actionable targets. So just like I said, if I've put on my Trello board that in six months time, I want to speak on this stage or speak at this event, then you've got to break down how are you actually going to get there? Because it's very easy for me to say, I don't know, within the next two, within the next two years, I want to be on stage at the 10X Growth Conference. You know, it's great to say that, but if you just keep looking towards that, you're not going to get anywhere. And it can be very, you know, the, the way that I like to think of it, there's the pyramid of needs. It's a philosophical concept. And the idea is, you know, we start at the bottom, uh, you know, with basic safety, the basic needs, sustenance, water and shelter. And it works all the way up to self-actualization. And the very, difference is, the very different thing is, is that once you get to achieving your potential, every other need as you fulfill it more and more, your motivation goes down. So if you are hungry and you eat, then you have less motivation to eat more because you're not as hungry. That's the different thing about achieving your potential or working towards a goal. The closer you get, the more, the more you are motivated. You know, if you're hit with this big target that you want to achieve in two years time, then it just looks like a brick wall, a brick wall in the distance that you're never going to get there. But if you break that down into actionable steps, okay, what does that actually mean? Well, realistically, to get that invite, I'm going to need to know one of the event organizers. How can I know one of the event organizers? Well, they have these friends. How can I get in front of them? Well, maybe starting a podcast and inviting them on. Maybe it's, you know, meeting them at other events. Whatever your goal is, it doesn't matter. But break it down so that every single day you have something to do that is working towards that goal. Great advice. And Elliot, what are some of your goals in the next couple of years? Sure thing. So I break down my goals and my plan into essentially two categories, my sort of professional corporate work and then my personal branding work. Mm -hmm. So recently back in, well, back at the start of the year, um, I sold my main company and uh, I founded a new company called the Invictus Group, which for me was essentially working as like a private investment company. So what we primarily do, we buy small businesses, um, sort of five to $10 million revenue range from business owners who are looking to retire in industries that aren't that interesting. And, you know, all the entrepreneurs that have just got their MBAs aren't interested in operating in, hugely scaling them onto a national level. And then we either keep them in the portfolio or then we sell them. And that is sort of the core thing that I do with that. So my big aim with that is to spend, you know, two or three years growing that up, building the performance. And eventually I said, I want to turn that into a public investment fund. So that's sort of my, my main corporate aim. And then on the personal branding level for me, it's all about essentially getting my message out there. I've done a lot of public speaking. I do a lot of schools. I do a lot of corporate, you know, I've done, I've done Fortune 100 companies. I've done national governments. I've done a lot of stuff for the UK government. I've done Ernst & Young. And I do a lot of the education system. And that's not a problem, but I, I want to reach more people. And that's why, you know, I'm, I'm on stage more, I'm on podcasts, I'm speaking to people more because for me, I want to be able to share my experiences and allow that to essentially change things for other people. Awesome. I love it, man. Love it. And Elliot, man, where can people find you? Sure thing. So um, my website is elliotpadfield.com. You've got some brief information there. If you want to get in touch with me, the best way is on Instagram. I'm at elliot.padfield. Um, but generally, hit me up anywhere. I'm very, very responsive. Um, and I mean, I, I host a podcast as well, which I'm releasing in a couple of weeks time called the Obsessed Entrepreneur Podcast. And I'm interviewing some of the top marketers of today's age to teach them all about that. I love it, man. You are someone who has done so much in so little time and I applaud you for it. And I know you are an inspiration to not only many people, but I've actually taken away a lot of things just from this in interview that I'm going to implement in my own life. So I appreciate you, man. 100%. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been a, <laughs> been a great opportunity for me to share, share my insights. So thank you. There are three takeaways from interviewing Elliot Padfield. Well, he calls it the three steps to building a successful business. First one is find a mentor or a coach who has done what you're trying to do. So if you're trying to become a successful speaker, find other successful speakers. If you're trying to become a musician, find another successful musician. 
find whoever you're trying to replicate because you can save a lot of time of trial and error, years and years of mistakes by finding someone who's done what you're trying to do. Second thing is, is to learn a valuable skill that people need. There are people out there that need, need to know how to do email marketing. There are people out there that need to know how to um, start a podcast. There are people out there that need to know how to build resilience. There are so many different needs in this world. Don't try to go for something based off of how much it will pay you. Go off of something that you're passionate about, something that you um, have potential to be good at, get really good at, and then start charging people. And the third thing is you need to start. There's no perfection ever in the game. A lot of people who became successful started somewhere. They weren't good in the beginning. So stop trying to be as good as everyone else and start. If I wasn't, if I didn't start public speaking and pursuing public speaking for a very long time, Teenage Impact would have never came about. Eventually you're going to find your mojo and eventually momentum is going to start happening after you start and take massive action. Thank you for tuning in to this podcast episode with Elliot Padfield. If you haven't done so already, please take that fun and interactive quiz. Tell a friend, family member, a classmate about the Teenage Impact Podcast. You never know who might need it. And if you're tuning in from Apple Podcasts, rate and review the Teenage Impact Podcast so it could be ranked higher and more people can discover it and feel inspired. So until next time, peace.